Hello students and welcome to learning unit number eight, which is the first unit after the midterm. In learning unit number eight, we're uh, back into the textbook covering chapter number seven, and that sets the stage for us to move on to the critical analysis paper that you're going to be writing for the major portion of this second half of the semester. Um, and what I'm doing to help you with that is I'm going to also in this video outline all of the questions for quiz number two, because quiz number two is my way of of, of giving you direction on how to actually write a critical analysis paper of an ethical issue or crisis. So let's get started with chapter number seven. Normative theories, for those of you that may not understand the term, is a way of indicating that this is what people have used in looking at leadership styles and looking at leadership effectiveness. And you have to create a theory that is built upon certain concepts about leadership. So in this chapter we cover those concepts that go into the theories that have been used by researchers in the field. The chapter starts off looking at transformational leadership and what it does is it contrasts that with transactional leadership. I'm not going to go slide by slide like I have in previous videos because um, now I think you've actually learned the importance of going through the slides yourself. So I'm going to save us all some time by not going through a slide by slide analysis of what you can go through on your own. And I think you'll get more out of it by having the slides up on your computer while you're reading the textbook and going through and seeing what the publisher found important enough to actually put onto a slide for you. And, and I hope you also learn because you're going to be doing your own presentation this semester I want you to also pay attention to how these slides are constructed. Um, these slides for me have way, way, way too much text on them. This is, this is like reading what they call a wall of text. And that's not effective slide design in my opinion. Research is not going to get out there unless you, as the researcher, promotes it. And you can't promote it effectively by putting out these walls of texts. Um, you might as well just say, you know what, this is a summary of the chapter. Well, which is what it is. But that's not how you pull in an audience and that's not how you give your research legs so that it can get moving on its own. You, you want your research to grow and blossom and flourish and you need to give it legs in order to do that. And that's what a good presentation does. That's not what a wall of text does. But these walls of text as the publisher prepared these slides is very effective as a study guide to help you go through the text. It's not an effective presentation, but it's a very good study guide. And that's why I've made these PowerPoint slides available to you, and I recommend that you use them in conjunction with the textbook. So now let's get back to the topic at hand here, comparing transformational leadership with transactional leadership. Transactional leaders are highly prone to creating, or at the very least not seeing, crises. That's an important thing to know, because when you're writing up your critical analysis paper, I believe you're going to see transactional leaders who are living in the here and now, not looking forward to anything in the future. They are just worried about what is important to them right now, right in the current moment. And they fail to see all of the signs that should be telling the leader and the organization that they're heading into a crisis. And with that, I'm going to give you a sneak peek at chapter 11, because later in this video, we're going to talk about quiz number two. And quiz number two starts out by digging into chapter 11, which is a chapter on ethical crisis leadership. So keep in mind that that's where we're going. Chapter 7 is saying these are the normative theories of leadership that we have used as academics in the field. And the reason why we use these normative theories of leadership is because we recognize that good leaders avoid crises. And that's where chapter 11 goes and that's where quiz number 2 goes. But now let's get back to chapter number 7. Transformational leadership has these nine charismatic and transformational attributes universally associated with them. This is a really good list that will help you when you're writing up your critical analysis paper. Anytime you see a list like this on any of these PowerPoint slides that you are hopefully have up on your computer while you're reading the textbook, you should consider it gold for your critical analysis paper. And I consider it gold for a quiz. Okay, because these are the points that I'm going to want to see, and these are the words that I'm going to want to see you use when you answer the questions and when you're writing up your critical analysis paper. So pay attention to slides like this anytime you see them come up, because when they have little short numbered lists like this, you can guarantee that that is something that you will be able to use and you should look for a way to use in your critical analysis paper and when you answer questions on quiz number two and the final exam. The next normative theory of leadership that Johnson covers in this chapter 7 is servant leadership. Once again, here's five concepts, a numbered list. Pay attention to that. Authentic leadership is the next normative theory that he digs into. It has four components. Once again, 
I'm not going through every slide. I'm just picking these slides that have these numbered lists. And, and these are what you should be paying attention to as you're looking to answer the questions on quiz number two and prepare your critical analysis paper. Aesthetic or beautiful leadership is an interesting one and it's got some very important traits in it which I want you to focus on but my first reaction when I said oh beautiful leadership and they started referencing the leadership style of President Kennedy was oh okay this is a very shallow form of leadership no charismatic leadership is a very shallow form of leadership aesthetic leadership has ethics embedded in it the charismatic leader often leaves ethics out because it's all about how to get the followership ethics be damned. Responsible leadership, once again another good list that you can pull from as he talks about how good leadership manifests itself in the following roles. And Taoism is the final normative theory that he covers off and he talks about how Taoism relies upon five metaphors or images. The one I like the best is the clay pot. And the clay pot is a good metaphor because what it does is it gives you something to look at but it's really nothing. A clay pot that is empty is an empty vessel. So what it's saying is I got you to focus on this clay pot, but there's nothing there. Because the clay pot isn't carrying anything if it's empty. And so that's why they use that. And, and that's the way Taoism works. It's, it's really an incredible tool for a leadership style. But there's a lot of cautions that Johnson tells you to look for on a Taoist approach to uh, looking at leadership. So that's the end of chapter 7. And now we're going to turn our focus on to quiz number 2 and the critical analysis paper that you have to write up. But before I do that, I need to tell you that I found it necessary to change my grading baseline from 100 points to 1,000 points. Primarily because I found it really difficult to grade the Sunday summaries out of two points. And, and so I've multiplied everything by, uh, by 10, and that allows me to grade each Sunday summary out of 20 points, and I can take two points off without it making it look like you got a 1.8 instead of a 2. So this grading change is now reflected in version 5 of the syllabus, so I apologize once again for giving you another version of the syllabus. But now it should be very clear that your final grade will be based out of 1,000 points, but you just divide everything by 10 in order to see what each component of your grade will be made up of as it relates to 100% of the final grade. One of the prime motivating factors for changing this baseline was the idea that I was going to have to start grading your critical analysis paper out of 5 points, 8 points, 9 points, and 8 points. So now I have more leeway in how I can actually grade you with 50 points, 80 points, 90 points, and 80 points. Let me touch off on why it's important that I grade this critical analysis paper in essentially five different elements because there's a lot of participation points involved in this as well. As you probably have realized now, by the way that I'm grading your topic suggestion when you submit it. The class participation points used to be 10 points and now it's 100 points and you will see by the end of this video how you're going to have the opportunity to earn the rest of your participation points because this is not a classroom based class. I have to figure out another way to get you to participate online and you'll see how I'm going to go about that from now to the end of the semester. The other motivating factor in changing the baseline was once again how the Sunday summaries used to be awarded out of two points, now they're awarded out of 20 points. Uh, the other thing which changed in the syllabus for version number five, uh, you all should have seen the email that came from the provost's office where the last date to withdraw, which was going to be this Friday coming up, which is why I had to actually crowd in the midterm or the quiz number one here, so that you could actually see how you're doing and get a bearing on your grade before the withdrawal date came up on Friday this week. Provost office, lo and behold, last Saturday, found it important, and I absolutely agree with their decision, to move the withdrawal date to April 3rd. So that new date is now reflected in the syllabus, version number 5. If you look in the syllabus for what is due on March 1st, coming up this Sunday, you will see, number 1, that your Sunday summary number 7 is due, as always, on Sunday night. But there is also, in red on the syllabus, the topic suggestion participation points, which you're going to earn this week. So I need you to submit something that tells me what you're going to do your critical analysis paper on. You'll find now that when you click on the participation points trigger on Blackboard, you're going to get a very, very full screen. One of those at the very top should be your 15 participation points that you will earn by proposing a topic for your critical analysis paper. I don't want you to just give me a topic. There are actually four steps included in putting together your proposal for your topic. You can't just say, oh, I want to write about this ethical issue or crisis. I need you to answer each one of these four points. Each one of them has a few points associated with it. So you have to respond to all four of these before you're going to earn the 15 participation points. 
And if you look at the rubric, this is how I'm actually going to create the rubrics for the participation points. And there will also be very similar rubrics designed for each component of your critical analysis paper. The columns which you'll see across the top are labeled proficient, competent, novice, marginal, and incomplete. So typically there will be four points associated with it, so it goes four, three, two, one, and zero on each one of these qualities that I'm looking for. In this case, the qualities that I'm looking for are the salience of the topic, how relevant is it, what makes this topic so important to people that they're going to read the whole article, your personal interest to the topic, that is worth four points, your position on this crisis, whether you think it was unfair, whether you think it was fair, philosophically, did it meet all of the criteria that Michael Sandel talked about in his 10 videos, 12 videos. And finally, I want to want you to tell me what your critical analysis paper will contribute to this because you're, you're going to be writing about this with an idea that you have an idea to improve this in the future. And this final topic here, what does it contribute? I need you to be able to tell me for three points as you're suggesting this topic, what you expect this paper to be able to offer as it looks deeper into the events and circumstances and leadership failures and organizational failures that contributed to how this crisis came about in the first place. There's also a new section on Blackboard now under the submissions block here on the left sidebar called Critical Analysis Paper. Everything related to submitting your critical analysis paper and getting a grade on it can be found in this folder. So if you click on it, what you'll see at the very top are the grading rubrics. This is another folder that if you click on it, you will actually get into the grading rubric that I showed you. The other thing that you're going to see when you click on this critical analysis paper link in the left sidebar of Blackboard is you're going to see a few images come up. Um, the first of these images um, will give you the suggested sections and subsections of this paper. We're going to talk about that in detail for quiz number two. And the other thing that you're going to see is this image here about how to write a critical paper. The reason I've provided this image under the critical analysis paper section of Blackboard is to get you thinking about how your paper is going to flow from beginning to end. The flow of a paper, especially a critical paper where you're going to be critical of something, you're going to analyze something, so that's why it's a critical analysis paper, is you first have to tell the reader what other people have said about this topic so that you're not all you can't base your argument on what you say unless you also build what you say on the foundation of what others who are experts in the field have said. So first in paper you have to say they say. In a research paper this is called the literature review section. In a critical analysis you have to essentially create the same thing as a literature review but it's not a research paper it is a critical analysis paper. You still have to go into the mindset of they say, and because of what they say, this is what I say, and then you conclude it by tying it all together. So this image is to get you thinking about that and pay attention to these little sections over here as well. And the only reason I spend any time on this at all is because that is what you're going to see when you click on the critical analysis paper folder in the left sidebar. So let's get back to the changes in the syllabus again. There's, there's probably some among you have, who have looked into the schedule and feeling a little bit of angst about what the last three weeks look like. And let me put your mind at ease about these last three weeks. And the only way I'm going to put your mind at ease is if you actually start working now in anticipation of what these deadlines mean for you in the last three weeks. This isn't a Sunday summary anymore. This isn't something where you read the textbook and on Sunday you put 15 minutes worth of work into something and put it in on Blackboard. These last three weeks are going to hit you like a freight train if you don't start preparing for them now. But it's very, very easy to start preparing for these last three weeks. And let me tell you how to do it. That's what this video is about. This video is to tell you what to do now and what I've put in here to help you work toward these last three weeks so that you can actually get well ahead of the game here and feel quite relaxed as these last three weeks come because if you do the right kind of preparation for these last three weeks you're only going to have to do a couple of hours of work every week in order to put the finishing touches on these before you upload them. So what's happening on these last three weeks? Well, on April 5th, quiz number two is due. On April 12th, the draft of your paper is due and your presentation is due. And on April 19th, your final paper is due and then on April 23rd to 29th you actually have to write the final exam. 
So, so there's actually four major events in four weeks. So the entire month of April, if you look at this syllabus, you're going to freak out and say, oh my God. But I would rather you think in your mind when you see these last four weeks coming up, the fourth being the final exam, is that Professor Levitt has given you a lot of help in making sure that these events unfold effortlessly. On April 5th, quiz number two is due. But I'm giving you the questions for quiz number two right now. And I'm telling you how to answer the questions for quiz number two. But you won't actually be able to finalize your answers for quiz number two until you actually get your draft paper due. So you've got the questions for quiz number two. Quiz number two is going to actually lead you into how to put together your outline and your draft paper and your presentation. So then by the time you've actually got a draft paper done, quiz number two is all answered. So you should be able to start answering quiz number two now. Go out there and find out what you need to know for the parts of quiz number two that will actually form part of your paper. Write that down. Put the answer into quiz number two. Put the slide that you will be generating into your PowerPoint presentation for your presentation. And by the time April 5th comes around, all you're going to have to do is just upload this document that you had to prepare anyways in order to get your draft paper together and your presentation together. And so as you're working on quiz number two, you're also getting your draft together. So that will just be a matter of finalizing a little bit of writing for your draft paper. And your presentation will already be falling together because four of the questions on quiz number two are related to slides on your PowerPoint presentation. And if you've done it well, as you'll see in this video here, your final paper isn't going to take much more than just a few tweaks. And I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to change if you get your rough draft to me on time, I will send it back to you so that all you have to do is make minor changes and your final paper will be due. So I'm going to tell you what you need to change for your final paper from what you gave me with your rough draft. And then you just have to focus on the final exam. So these four weeks are nothing more than just uploading files that you're going to be working on over the next two months, the last half of the semester here. So how do we start with all of this? Well, for all of the questions for quiz number two are now up on Blackboard. You get there by clicking on critical analysis paper and download quiz number two question. The quiz starts off by telling you when it's due, April 5th before 11.59 p.m. Question number one talks about the 10 types of crises that are described on page 417. So once again, in keeping with my testing style, I tell you where to go to answer the question. I don't expect you to read the whole textbook to figure out what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something very specific and you find it on page 417. That's worth one point. Question number two is related to question number one. It asks you, was the crisis mentioned in question number one precipitated during an organizational response or reaction to another crisis situation named on the list of 10 crises? So first off, off the list of 10, pick one that was actually, that actually led into the crisis that you're going to look at or the ethical issue that you're going to look at with your critical analysis paper and tell me was this precipitated by some other crisis that happened before that led into the second crisis. So was the ethical issue or crisis a second crisis that was brought on by an inability to respond to another kind of crisis? Question number three worth 10 points using box 11.1. .1. Once again I tell you exactly where to go page 418, 419 you'll find box 11.1 .1. Using box 11.1 .1 from the Johnson textbook, describe the pre-crisis stage of this ethical issue or scandal and outline your own ideas for what could have prevented this crisis. Once again here, this is my answer style. Maximum of 150 words or 10 lines of 12 point font text. And answers longer than 250 words will lose points. Pulling from page 423, question number four here, pulling from page 423 of the Johnson textbook, describe the trigger event that took the organization from its pre-crisis state into the crisis itself. Once again, another 150 word answer. These are short, short answers. These ones are 150 word answers. There's no question on this quiz that will require more than 150 to 250 words to answer. So now let's get into what you do to answer these five questions. Well, these questions all came from chapter 11. So I'm giving you a sneak peek into chapter 11 here so that you understand how leadership can fail in a crisis and how a crisis is typically what creates an ethical issue because of the organization's inability to respond properly to a crisis. Or it was actually an ethical issue that created the crisis because the organization did not have the ability to catch that ethical breach or prevent it 
by not having the proper training available to individuals within the organization. So here's the list of the crises that you'll see on chapter 11. Once again, these PowerPoint slides are available for you to download. Don't go ahead and read chapter 11 now. Chapter 11 is part and parcel of what you're going to actually have to do to answer quiz number two. I'm giving you an idea of what you're going to be up against as you answer the questions on quiz number two because as you work on your critical analysis paper you're going to start building elements of that paper out of these questions. So when we get to the point where we're reading chapter 11 you are reading chapter 11 with the idea that you are going to harvest out of that chapter all of these points that are going to go into your critical analysis paper. And in this case it's identifying stage one of that crisis, which is called the pre-crisis, and identifying stage two, the actual crisis event itself. And pay attention to these lists that you see on these slides, because something on these slides is going to guide you through your own critical analysis paper. So box 11.3 of the textbook provides you with this really quick snapshot of the stages of a crisis in management the pre-crisis, the crisis event, and the post-crisis analysis. What your critical analysis paper is, is a look at this post-crisis period to say, this is what led to the crisis, this is what the crisis did to the organization, and this is why the crisis was as bad as it was and worse than it probably needed to be because the organization and the leaders did not have this, 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 and this. And that's what chapter 11 is going to help pinpoint. And those slides with bullet points on them are going to give you a pick list where you can say, this is what applies to my paper. And you pull that out and you say, out of all of these traits, or out of all of these virtues, or out of all of these situations that the author highlighted, that the work of others has highlighted, once again, this is in your paper, this is the they said component. They said leaders who do not have this quality will experience this kind of challenge in their organization. And that's what you need to say. So they say, don't do this. I say, or your paper says, they did this and it caused this. And then that's your conclusion. So that's the they say, I say, and because of that format that you're going to do in this critical analysis paper. Question number five on the quiz asks you to provide a summary of the context and framing of the ethical issue or scandal that your critical paper will analyze in depth. Once again, 150 words maximum. And then question number six is related to question number five and it asks you to reformat the above context and framing summary for a PowerPoint slide by presenting it in five or six bullet points with eight to 12 words in each of the bullet point sentences. Now, less is more as it says down here in italics. Less is more in this case. It is far better to never exceed the five bullet points and using 40 point font never have a bullet point sentence run into a second line. These are personal preferences of mine but I think you will do better in your presentation if you follow this as a guideline because what it gives you is it gives you the trigger for your brain to say oh okay this bullet point tells me what I want to talk about but I'm going to talk about it, you're going to look at me during my presentation and not read this wall of text. If you have too much text on your slide, everybody goes, oh, okay, just shut down that droning voice of his because I can read everything he's saying here. Now, what good is that? Number one, it doesn't communicate the same thing to the audience as your voice. Your voice, if you build passion into your voice and if you're not this automaton robot, they will see the eight to ten words on this line and they will hear your 30 second, 40 second explanation about what this means to you and what it should mean to them. And if you're an effective communicator with your voice, this combined with your voice will give that point resilience in the memory of your audience. So what was I talking about when I mentioned the context and framing? Well, in your introduction, these are, once again, this, this image is up on Blackboard. So when you click on the critical analysis paper folder in the left sidebar, you will see this image up on Blackboard. Anytime you need to refresh your memory, just go into Blackboard, look at this image. These are the suggested sections and subsections for your paper. Your introduction, including your opening thesis paragraph, should include something that gives me context and framing for the critical issue or scandal. So question number five, 
asks you in 150 words to 250 words to explain to me what you're going to say in this context and framing section of your introduction. It goes in the introduction as a subsection with its own heading. So the introduction on your Word document should be in bold. You can put 12 point font or 14 point font if you want. But a subsection heading should be in italics on a line by itself. And I want to see a subsection heading in your introduction that says context and framing. And in that subsection, I want you to give me in about a half a page in your actual critical analysis paper, the backstory behind this scandal or the issue that, that you're going to look at in your critical analysis paper. To answer question number five, all I want you to do is give me a 150 word snapshot of what you're going to put on this half page, three quarter page context and framing section, subsection in your paper. And then for question number six, summarize it even further into five bullet points so that you can put it into your PowerPoint presentation. So do you see what quiz number two is doing? Quiz number two is saying, oh, okay, this subsection here needs to deal with context and framing. In 150 words, my context and framing is going to tell the audience this. In my PowerPoint presentation, my five bullet points are going to tell my audience this. So if you can actually, for quiz number two, at this point, you don't need to commit to paper anything more than 150 words. Just put your idea down in 150 words and five bullet points. You can write this up later, but quiz number two is walking you through how to create each one of these sections in your critical analysis paper. For question number seven, worth 10 points, you need to write a concluding paragraph for the failures in leadership section of your paper. The paragraph should touch on each important topic that you covered in detail in each subsection of this portion of your paper. 150 words maximum, 250 words. For question number eight, once again, give me the five or six bullet points that you're gonna use on your PowerPoint slide. So once again, let's click on critical analysis paper in Blackboard and come up here and see this image where you get to see all of your section headings. We're talking about an introduction, failures in leadership. Ah, there it is. The failures in leadership section is right here. And what does it say about subsections? It says, C. Johnson textbook topics. So you're going to pull your subsection headers for this section of your paper out of what you find in the textbook that is related to your chosen topic. And we're going to repeat this for the organizational failures section of your paper and the evaluation and comparison section of your paper and your conclusion. So let's carry on with the quiz. Where are we at? Question number nine, write a concluding paragraph. Now what I say this, what you're, what you're going to give me for question number nine on quiz number two should fit very neatly as the concluding paragraph of this whole organizational failures section. So you're going to start the section and say the organizational failures that I'm going to focus on are blah, 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 blah. Once again, thinking about the they said, I said format of a critical paper, you're going to go into subsections within this organizational failures section based on what you find in the Johnson textbook that says, that, that gives you the foundation that you need. The foundation being what they said, they being the experts. The experts that Johnson put into the textbook. He cites lots and lots and lots of experts in his textbook. He gives you bullet points in his PowerPoint slides himself. Somewhere in there, you will find very important points about organizational failures that you will be able to put into your paper under the they said category. So that later on, you will be able to get into what you think could have been done to avert the issue, should be done to prevent it from happening in the future. Question number 10, once again, give me your PowerPoint slide, five to six bullet points. Question number 11, the next section of your paper is the evaluation and comparison section of your paper. This is the section where you get into what I said. Now, I don't want you to write your paper in first person. That's never a good idea to write a critical analysis paper in first person. But think about it as they said, I said. So instead of thinking about it as they said, I said, think about it in terms of they said and this paper says. So avoid the use of the word I by saying this paper will, or the theory presented in this paper says, and that way you avoid using the word I. So I don't want you to write in first person, but think of it in terms of this is what they said, this is what I'm going to say in my paper. 
and then reference your paper as you in the third person. So for question number 11, the evaluation and comparison section of your paper, the paragraph should touch on each important topic that you covered in detail in each subsection of this portion of your paper. It is the concluding paragraph of this evaluation and comparison section. You, you don't have to outline what you're actually going to put into this section right now. What you have to do to answer this question on quiz number two is think about what you hope to find and what you hope is supported as it relates to your own theory and condense that into 150 words. Provide that to me for question number 11. Condense it into five or six PowerPoint bullets and give me that for question number 12. So by the time you've answered all of these questions for quiz number two to this point, your draft of your paper should be almost ready to write. You should be able to sit down with these answers to this quiz and start typing away knowing where you're going to go in the Johnson textbook to support your argument in the they said section, which is the failures in leadership section and the organizational failures section. So somewhere in the textbook you will find bullet points on the PowerPoint slides that the publisher prepared as it relates to the Johnson textbook. And then you will be able to say, my theory proposes that this is what could have avoided the situation and this is what will help them pull out of their situation. So now we come to question 14, which asks you to write out your thesis sentence. Now, I'm, I'm still amazed at how many people can be in a 4,000 level course at FAU and not and fully understand what a thesis sentence is and where it belongs. So I'm going to give you seven points for writing out your thesis sentence. It is one sentence. Question number 15 asks, where is the sentence located in your paper? I'm going to give you that answer right now. It is the last sentence in your opening paragraph. Okay, question number 16 for one point asks, when do most experienced writers actually get serious about writing their thesis paragraph? Well, they get serious about writing it right now at question 16 in an 18 question quiz. So I've walked you through your introduction section. Give me the context and framing for your critical analysis paper. I've walked you through the failures in leadership section. I've walked you through the organizational failures section. I've walked you through the evaluation section. At this point, you will have the full outline for your paper ready. And with this outline completed, only then are you really in a good position to write your thesis statement down and commit it to paper. And then around that thesis statement, create a thesis paragraph that gives your reader in one paragraph little nuggets of information that tells them, this is what I think is a problem in public administration. This is why this problem that I'm going to deal with came about. This is what we all need to be aware of. And this is my thesis sentence. So in roughly four sentences, which is your thesis paragraph, you build this ladder that when you reach the top of the ladder, you nail them with a thesis sentence. So question number 14 asks for the sentence. Question number 15 asks you to tell me where you're going to put that sentence. Remember the answer is at the very end of your thesis paragraph, which is the first paragraph in the entire paper. And question number 16 says, when are you going to actually finalize your thesis paragraph, the opening paragraph? You're going to put together a draft of what you think it might be right now but you're not going to even make an attempt to say this is my finished thesis paragraph until you've written the entire paper. And then you're going to come back to the opening paragraph and say, does this still fit this paper the way it turned out? And if it doesn't, and it hardly ever does, then you need to alter it, which is why that is one of the defining traits of a good writer. Question number 17 asks you for your first major core citation that you're going to provide me with that supports your idea outside of the Johnson textbook. It has to be an APA style. There are two points associated with this. And you will lose one point for each mistake you make in an APA style citation. So you make two mistakes in your APA style citation here and you're going to get zero on question number 17. Question number 18 asks for your second full citation in APA 6 style for the second peer-reviewed source that you're going to go to to support this paper outside of the Johnson textbook. So I need two outside sources that are not part of Michael Sandel and not part of Johnson. And you will know where to pull them from once you start getting into your they said section of this paper. They said is a direct reference to these kinds of outside respected sources that will support your argument for what you're going to claim 
could have been done to avoid the disaster or the scandal and should be done now to get this organization out of the situation that it finds itself in. So back to the version 5 of the syllabus, your outline, which will essentially be done. Once again, see how easy this is? All you have to do is walk through quiz number 2 and your outline will fall together which is due on March 22nd, so that's coming up fairly soon here. An outline is a version of this framework done entirely as bullet points. The outline does not include anything related to the conclusion. So it is not written in prose, it does not have full sentences. One page is sufficient if it touches on every section. If it goes over two pages you will lose marks. So I need to see an outline that essentially just says this is my topic, this is why I chose it, here's the context and the framing for it, this is what leadership failures were, this is what organizational failures were, this is what my evaluation of it is likely going to say, done. That's it. Once again, revisiting the very last weeks, your rough draft is due on April 12th, along with your PowerPoint presentation. By then, for your PowerPoint presentation, you should have four slides already prepared because you've submitted quiz number two back here on April 5th. Finish fleshing out the rest of your PowerPoint presentation and add the audio. By April 12th, you need to finish your PowerPoint presentation and either give me an audio clip that goes with your PowerPoint slides, but far preferred would be that you actually learn how to do the embedded audio within the PowerPoint presentation so that when I advance the slide I can hit the play button and I can hear the audio that's about that slide. And that presentation with the multimedia component has to be all finished and submitted by April 12th. And then your final paper, based on the feedback that I gave you from your rough draft, needs to be in by April 19th. Now, a little bit about the rough draft. The draft is due on April 12th. Give me your best shot with this rough draft. If you've taken me for research methods, I called it the almost finished draft, but I'm changing that. So what I would rather see from you is on April 12th, I would rather see a fully finished critical analysis paper that I can look at and say, wow, this is really good. You're scoring in the 90 percents here. I'm going to consider this your final paper as well. And I'm going to give you, let's say you get 92 percent, 93 percent on your rough draft. I didn't find hardly anything to take any marks off. I'm going to ask you, do you want me to consider this rough draft your final draft and just give you a 93 percent on the final draft so that you don't even have to submit anything and be done with it? That means you've got two weeks to study for the final exam and your other final exams if you give me your best shot with your rough draft. Now if you totally blow the rough draft and I give you 60, 70 percent, the rough draft is only worth eight points out of your final grade. So let's say you lose two or three points out of that and you get five out of eight points, which would be about 60, 70 percent. So if you get a 60 or 70 percent on your rough draft, you'd be crazy to say, yeah, I want to keep that for my final grade. I'm going to send you back everything that you need to change on your rough draft on the week of April 12th. So your rough draft has to be into me on April 12th. And I'm going to send back to you within one day or two days everything you need to change in order to make your final draft something that's going to score in the high 90s. This critical analysis paper is worth 30 percent of your grade. I'm not going to put all of the weight on one paper that you just have to work on on your own and submit to me and not know whether you did a good job or not. You're going to know whether you did a good job on your outline. You're going to know whether you did a good job on your rough draft. And then you're going to have a chance to clean that all up. So from the outline to the rough draft, you're going to have a chance to clean up any failings. From the rough draft, you're also going to have another chance to clean up any failings so that you can actually bring your score up instead of everything relying upon what you submit first time, first effort. So you're going to know well in advance if you're doing really poorly on this. And that's why I've designed this this way. But if you do really good on your rough draft and you score in the 90s or 80s and 90s and you're happy with that, I will give you the same grade on your final draft and you don't even have to write it. Okay, this may be the last video for about a month. So as soon as I get this video done, I'm going to sit down and grade all of your quizzes and then I have to focus on my dissertation. So you have everything now that you need in order to work through this next month, the month of March. You've got spring break coming up next week as well, and then after that you read a couple more chapters that are all related to writing a good critical analysis paper. You've got this video that tells you how to answer quiz number two questions. You've already got quiz number two questions. I still need to see Sunday summaries coming in for the next three weeks based on what you're reading, and then the reading is done. And at that point, you should be able to dedicate 100% of your time and energy to writing your critical analysis paper and preparing your presentation, answering quiz number two. I will give you the questions for the final exam as well as an exam review video so that you'll know what to 
do to answer the final exam questions. And there's probably going to be one more video that tells you a little bit more information about finishing up a really nice PowerPoint presentation and how to put that together. So this will be the last video for a while and uh, look forward to another video that tells you how to do your presentation and another video that tells you all about the final exam questions. Before I end the video, I want to tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing for participation points. Once again, I mentioned if you click on the participation points triggers here in the left sidebar of Blackboard, you're going to come up with a very full page. Right now, this week, the participation points trigger is about choosing a topic. And the other participation points triggers that are coming down the pipeline are all related to first looks. Um, if you've had me for research methods, you know that I like to give you an opportunity to send something into me so that I can just give you a quick opinion on it. I'm not going to read it, I'm not going to go into it thoroughly, but I'm going to quickly scan it as a first look, and whether it's good or whether it's bad, you're still going to earn the participation points by getting it into me by the deadline. I'm not as much interested in the quality of what you give me on your first look as I am interested in knowing that you are actually ahead of the game and you are engaged in the process of writing your critical analysis paper. So to that end, the participation points triggers that I'm going to award on March 15th will allow you the opportunity to earn 15 points by sending me a first look of your outline. Two weeks later, I'm going to give you an opportunity to earn 20 participation points by giving me a first look at your quiz number two answers. And what that should tell you is that I want to see quiz number two well underway a week before the actual quiz number two deadline. So on March 29th, if you give me what you have for quiz number two, you can earn 20 points just by indicating to me that you've got something down for each one of the answers that I've asked for. It's out of 20 points because there are 18 questions on quiz number two. I will give you one point for just giving me your name because you would be amazed at how many students leave their name off of their papers. So you get one point for a name, and then I will deduct one point for every unanswered question on the quiz. Like I said, this is about participation. This is not about quality at this point in time. This is a week before the actual quiz is due for grading. All I want to see on March 29th is something reasonable that tells me that you have put some effort into this quiz a week before it's due. And if you haven't got anything in, or if you don't submit this, you're going to lose out on 20 points. That's 2% of your final grade. Anything you see 20 points divided by 10, that's how much of your final grade you could lose. So here is a 2% gift towards your final grade if all you do is put down a reasonable effort to answering all 18 questions on the quiz and put your name on the top of it. The final participation points trigger that I'm going to put together for you is 20 participation points for giving me a first look at your PowerPoint presentation. So once again, I'm not going to let you totally fail and fall flat on your face if by April 5th you send me something as it relates to each one of your PowerPoint slides. And what I'm going to be looking for, more importantly than anything else, is the four slides that was required to answer the questions that already were part of quiz number two. So when you go into participation points triggers here on Blackboard, this is what you'll see now. And the deadlines are clear there. I will send you emails, and in some cases I'm probably even embedded in a video when I talk about the how to do the PowerPoint presentation. But it's very clear here what you need to have a week or two weeks before anything is due in order to earn participation points. Participation points are about being engaged. These questions here allow me to see how engaged you are before the actual deadlines are coming. I, I do want to say that you have put together some really good Sunday Summary topics and based on what I've seen for the Sunday Summary topics, I'm going to see some equally amazing topics that you're prepared to take on as part of this critical analysis paper that you're going to write. And I just want to let you know that I'm looking forward to reading them. Thank you.